welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit macrohive.com. So welcome, Yesha, to our podcast show. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while now. Bilal, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is a wonderful way for me to kick off the new year. Um, it's such a pleasure to be on your podcast. I've heard uh, prior episodes and um, I'm just totally thrilled to get to have this conversation. Great. And before we go into the meat of our conversation, I always like to ask guests something about their origin story. So if you could, could you tell me something about what you studied at university and, you know, was it inevitable you would end up following the, the career path that you had in, in law and financial markets? I mean, I, I absolutely not. I think the origin story is, is first and foremost that I, um, I grew up in Glasgow. So, um, that's really where, um, I'm from and I've, 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 sort of grown up and, and feel like um, the I went to study more than languages and French and uh, French and German and law at university and I had absolutely no idea that I would be studying financial markets at that time in fact um, it was the very opposite thing that I thought I would be doing uh, when I went to law school um, in the UK I was thinking that I would maybe do um, public interest, uh, maybe I would work um, in that field, but um, as it happens, um, needed money as it were, so I had to get a job. Um, and initially I was very skeptical um, of the world that I'm currently living in and love, um, but I went to my law firm, I worked in financial regulation and derivatives, um, and that was prior to the crisis. And um, entering that world, you just see that it's a fascinating environment to be in just from an academic perspective, from the um, from the perspective of professional opportunities to be able to engage in different kinds of um, uh, tasks to analyze problems, to think about market structure. And what happened obviously in 2008 was seminal. Um, when Bear Stearns started to fall apart, I think that was the first time I realized that everything that I was seeing in front of me wasn't natural, right? Like the market structure that was um, taken for granted, that always just seemed to be producing all this economic growth, at least uh, at that time, that it wasn't fundamentally as perfect as we thought it was, essentially. And that all the folks that I thought knew everything, the big time partners and the traders and all the principles I was um, acting for as a lawyer at that time, that they didn't have all the answers, far from it. Um, and I think that gave me an opportunity for the first time to think that maybe there are real questions to explore here um, from an academic standpoint and a regulatory standpoint. Um, and that's really what drove me to academia um, and got me to to think about that world uh, when I was living in the world of um, financial regulation, traders, the kind of industry. I, I don't know if you've seen the show. Um, I but- have. Yeah, I love the yeah. show. I've actually had uh, the writers of the show come on my podcast before as well. Oh, no actually, way. So How amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that was that was uh, obviously that's a fantastic, uh, um, fantastic and fabulous uh, version of, of the world. But certainly, you know, that was the world uh, prior to that. So that's a little bit of the origin story. Um, it's complicated and not particularly interesting, but there we are. And now you're based in the U.S., is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I um, arrived in the U.S. in August 2015. So that uh, 2008. Sorry, that was terrific timing. Um, just prior to September 15, 2008. So I arrived there to to do a master's degree, uh, and now I'm an academic um, at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, uh, where I research financial regulation, um, market structure, fintech, crypto. Um, so that's kind of been the trajectory. Um, in the middle, I had a um, a few years at the World Bank, where I was working on post-crisis financial standard uh, st- standard setting and, and examinations. Yeah, that's great. And you have become uh, an expert in microstructure, I have to say, reading your work and, and listening to your, your uh, other interviews as well. So maybe we can start with the treasury market, you know, supposedly, you know, the largest, most liquid, most important bond market in the world. Um, so what's, I mean, what's wrong with it? <laughs> what's wrong with the functioning of the bond market or the treasury market? And Bilal, I hate to start on such a Debbie Downer note, but right now when you talk about the treasury market and you talk to folks that are living and working in this market, they might respond with what's not wrong with it. You know, what's right with it at this point? That it is a market that is 
fundamentally broken in ways that are being experienced in a very real way. Now, the treasury market being dysfunctional at this point really isn't a surprise to those of us that have been researching and looking at this marketplace. It has been fragile for a while. Now, the standard assumption that guides treasuries, Bilal, is that they are the most risk-free asset. And of course, that's true. The assets themselves, the bonds themselves, they are uh, supposed to be completely free of default risk. The U.S. is supposed to pay its debt on time. Um, the U.S. is supposed to pay its debt exactly as it agrees to do. And if it doesn't do that, obviously something is very wrong with the world and we have far bigger problems to think about. And so clearly the actual instrument, the Treasury itself, is risk-free for all intents and purposes. But the markets in which these Treasuries are trading are not. Um, and that 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 belief in the market sanctity is something that is now quickly being eroded in the actual marketplace itself. But for those of us that do research in this field, it's not surprising, right? This market is like any other market. It is not risk-free. It comes with a whole host of traditional problems that have beset marketplaces. Now, over the last 10 years or so, the treasury market has changed radically in its market structure. Um, it's gone from a market that's pretty boring, essentially, in its market structure, that's very over-the-counter, that's driven by telephonic-based trading, to one now that's incredibly automated, um, to a segment of this treasury market that is highly driven by very quick trading traders, these automated high-speed traders. That is a key part of this secondary market marketplace, and that's going to bring with it Lots of benefits for liquidity in some sense, but also it's going to bring with it the normal problems that HFTs have um, spawned in other markets, obviously, in relation to the automation, the operational issues, the um, the, the the business model the HFTs deploy, which is to have low uh, capital uh, buffers when trading. We can talk about all of these things, but just normal market um, aspects that have been seen in other markets, but in the treasury market, the, the rules have not been developed to deal with them. The practices of, are, are, are lesser developed to deal with them. In addition, the treasury market since 2008 is being asked to do a lot. So the treasury market in 2008 has expanded from being a market that was around $5 trillion worth of marketable debt outstanding to currently around $24 trillion. And we're asking the treasury market to save us, to keep us alive, to keep society going as we see it. But more than that, in addition to just funding the everyday functions of society, is to function as a safe asset for the entire global marketplace. Um, this has become post Dodd Frank, post rulemaking in the UK following the financial crisis and the EU. Um, US Treasuries, as well as obviously um, sovereign debt from developed economies around the world, have become very key safe assets for banks, for uh, any number of financial firms to maintain. And we saw that, for example, in the case of the UK with the guilt crisis recently, that these assets are called upon to act as safety buffers, to act as liquidity providers in the event that there's a crisis. And this role has expanded. Now, in addition, obviously, as a sort of final point to this, and I'll promise I'll stop talking, the US Treasury market is also under a huge amount of strain, right? So we saw that in the context of COVID, where these liquidity problems really came to the fore in a super dramatic way. But we're seeing it right now, right? Like with inflation, with recession, with foreign governments around the world, like, you know, the Japanese, for example, trying to manage the fact of a super strong dollar, right? By um, now selling a bunch of treasuries instead of buying them. So all these different pressures that are coming to bear in this treasury market. So it's unsurprising that liquidity in this market is really the worst it's been for a number of years, that the market depth in this market, according to a JP Morgan report um, last year, was is you know amongst the worst that they've experienced. So it's unsurprising that this is happening at this point, that people are finding it very hard to trade without impacting prices, finding it very hard to trade large orders of treasuries, which has really been the mainstay of the treasury market that people have always expected they would be able to do that. You mentioned some of the macro strains, obviously inflation, the Fed's been raising rates, the central bank's been raising rates as well. So, I mean, can we disentangle the two? You know, so there's been a deterioration in the market liquidity. I mean, how much of that is just because we're changing the macro regime from low inflation to high inflation? So naturally, there will be this adjustment phase. 
for treasuries and how much of it is actually the microstructure of markets, you know, just the way the markets are traded, the players in the market, uh, latency, you know, all of these other issues, um, you know, how, how, how would you assign weights to either one of the two? It's a really fundamental question, Bilal, and it's a super hard one to answer, right? Like this is one in which it's, this market is so deeply enmeshed in the way in which the 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 macroeconomic environment is reflected. Um, it's so deeply entwined, intertwined with just the way in which traders are managing sort of everyday basic orders. So that's where the market structure comes in. That trying to disentangle the two is proving to be a very complicated task. And there are lots of folks that are asking the question that you've just asked, which is what's causing this problem? Is it the fact that we are dealing with this incredibly weird macroeconomic environment where we've had incredibly high inflation last year, where we're worried about a recession this year, where we've had rate rises that have meant that treasury yields have been much more volatile um, over the past um, over the past uh, year but we're dealing with the Fed engaging in quantitative tightening and setting a benchmark of um, of 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 lightening their balance sheet by around ninety five billion dollars a month since September. So these are all the big macroeconomic factors here. But to be perfectly honest with you, Bilal, like if we look at the the the, the microstructure of this market, it has been under strain for a long time. It's not just twenty twenty. It has been suffering problems since twenty, uh, you know, since twenty fourteen, when it became clear that the flash rally happened, which was this weird conniption that took place in the market, in the treasury market, where prices in the treasury market in October twenty fourteen went haywire for around thirty minutes, and no one really knew why. And then regulators in twenty fifteen produced a report where they basically confessed to the fact they never really understood how this market was working in the first place, right? They confessed to the fact in writing five top expert agencies in the U.S. came together to produce this report. Um, and they basically said that, look, yo, you know, we did not realize that this market had automated to the extent that it had. And what that pointed to was a market that had dramatically changed in its structure, but about which there was so little information. And then it has emerged, you know, for those of us that are in the legal space, that the laws and the rules and the and the, and sort of the general industry private self-regulation in this market is also something that is very unsystematic, right? Very normal rules like reporting requirements to regulators. They've only been recently put in place, right? So they've only recently emerged in 2017 and updated in 2019. So it's unsurprising that regulators did not have a full picture of what was going on. Now, you know, in the context of looking at basic microstructural safeguards that we see in other marketplaces like circuit breakers for HFTs or making sure that you have trading systems that have um, that are going into platforms that have strict rules in place about how to manage the operational risk, how to manage this, the order of order pressure that exists to make sure that there are no spoofing orders and so forth. None of that safeguard stuff that we are taking for granted in derivatives and equities and so forth, none of that stuff is in place in a systematic way in treasuries, like because the rulemaking framework is just non-existent in effect. Um, and so that microstructure is extremely fragile because one, we really don't understand it super well. We've lacked historic information. Number two, the traditional safeguards that might protect that market don't exist in a systematic framework. Now, of course they do, but it's more ad hoc in, in some ways. Now they do because, you know, private actors will do it themselves, but the systematic rulemaking and safeguards and accountability at the top is lacking. Um, and three, this, this market structure has changed from one that's been primary dealer dominated to now being HFT dominated in the secondary market for um, a segment of this market, a dealer to client market. Um, and so in that context, obviously, the, the 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 structure of this market has changed, the players have changed, the risk that they bring into this market has changed, and their capacity to absorb that risk has changed. So HFTs are traditional securities firms, primary dealers are banks. Those are two very different regulatory profiles. So trying to disentangle, however, how this market is responding to these changes in microstructure versus how this market structure is now then dealing with the demand for selling orders from foreign governments like the Japanese, for example, or as took place in March 2020, dealing with the arrival of new players like hedge funds and HFTs, dealing with the volatility in treasury yields, it's really hard to disentangle. Um, you know, there was um, 
uh, I think a, a Bank of America report, I think it was Bank of America, I could be wrong, that was discussing the fact that actually it's not the volatility in the general marketplace that's making the treasury market structure volatile. It's the treasury market structure illiquid, illiquidity that is contributing to the volatility, right? So there are all these different opinions now about what is driving this real slowdown, this dysfunction, this glitchiness in treasury market structure. It's really hard to disentangle because of how fundamental this market is, how intertwined it is in everyday functionalities. I mean, well, one thing I found, I mean, I've been in markets for, 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 for a while, is that, you know, when you start to get automated traders in the market, what seems to happen is that in normal times, the markets are very efficient and liquid. But then you get these pockets where you get kind of flash crash dynamics, where suddenly there's a bout of illiquidity, which is really, really bad. Um, when you have voice traders, you get less of that. So with voice traders, I find that you get in normal times, slightly less efficient markets than automated trading. But in crazy times, voice traders step up and you know stabilize the market somewhat, and and you know the automation you get the reverse of that. I mean, have you found that from your perspective? Have you found something similar occurring as well? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really interesting you make that observation. I mean, when one looks at high frequency traders that are coming into this market, they've come into this market with a particular business profile, right? They're securities firms, they're prop trading firms. They usually operate to try and be flat at the end of the day. Um, their capital requirements, their basic requirements for how much money they have to trade with is relatively lower because they are transacting at in fleeting moments in time. Um, they are taking on risk on their books for very short durations. And so they don't have to operate with the same level of deep base of reserves that, say, JP Morgan or Citigroup and others have to operate when they are constantly um, taking massive risks on their books all the time. And so the, the, this, but the, you know, the HFTs can bring obviously a lot of at least, um, you know, immediate liquidity into this market. And there are financial studies that talk about the fact that they've added to short-term liquidity gains in this market. But equally, the fact is that they are automated. They're pre-programmed to transact in very rapid fires, moments of time, milliseconds, microseconds. They have to be pre-programmed to do that. We as human beings can't follow that in real time. We have to pre-program these algos to do that. Now, this means that if the algos are not able to cope with the changing market conditions, or if it gets hairy, if it gets kind of crazy and 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 just very 2020, if that happens, then these then these HFTs have to essentially pull back for two reasons. One, the algos can't cope because these conditions are not built into the programming as easily. Um, and number two, because the capital is much lower, right? The ability just within the body of the HFT farm to absorb uh, losses is much less because they just don't have that level of money to go forth and 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 transact and take a whole bunch of risk on their books. So the temptation in that context for an HFT is just to remove itself. So, you know, there are two big forces that would drive these moments of um, rapid illiquidity in this market for environments that are very dependent on HFT, which is the fact that you're dealing with firms that are very pre-programmed in their um, setup and two, don't necessarily have the same level of capital buffers that say JP Morgan's and others would have. So for example, in the US treasury market, we have seen um, you know, bouts of illiquidity where the HFTs have removed themselves from the market very quickly. So for example, in March, 2020, various reports uh, discuss the fact that the HFTs, uh, that the level of HFT activity diminished very quickly in that time. Um, equally, it's not to let the big banks off the hook, right? So even though, as you say, that the big banks themselves are um, normally used to dealing with more um, stressful environments, that they're able to handle the fact that um, there is this um, this marketplace that is harder and more uncertain to deal with through voice trading and through their own um, interactions and experience, they also are minded to leave the market too. So in the case of the US Treasury market, for example, primary dealers as well have removed themselves from the market in times of trouble repeatedly. Um, and so it's not to simply say that the primary dealers, the ones that are used to dealing with voice trading, et cetera, that they don't also remove themselves from the market when the going gets tough. 
As a broader research matter, though, there are several papers that do discuss the fact um, that um, the envir that the environment in which we often find ourselves today, very volatile and stressful, is more conducive for human beings rather than machines. Right. So there are a couple of great papers written by fantastic um, finance academics um, that you know discuss the fact that human traders tend to be better at managing very stressful environments. And I can certainly provide links to those papers if that would be helpful. Um, and that voice traders, when they step in, are better used to dealing with um, an environment that's more turbulent. So just in terms of instinct, that seems to be borne out by the finance literature out there that is being produced currently. But just from an institutional standpoint, I think it's clear to see why HFTs have trouble in being able to transact in very volatile environments. And now you've mentioned uh, 2020 a few times. Of course, you're, I think you're referring to March 2020 during the COVID outbreak period where treasury markets suddenly became extremely volatile uh, for a market that's supposed to be the safe haven market that wasn't supposed to exhibit that level of volatility. So we're, we're two, two and a half years on from that period. What, what's the consensus around what, what happened in that period? Why, why did liquidity dry up in treasury markets around that time? Bilal, it's like an insanely important question that we're still trying to deal with, okay. right? Like, there are so many studies which are like, what the hell just happened in this market? Like, why did this market go from being the one that's supposed to be the shock absorber to the entire galaxy? Like, this is meant to be the absolute um, gold standard of risk absorption. The reason why it's there is to be this premier market for uh, as a, uh, to be the safe haven for the entire financial system, why did this market behave in a way that contributed to the problem rather than deal dealt with the problem? Um, and there are still huge amounts of debate as to what exactly happened. Now, for example, like you know, one segment is questioning the fact that you have hedge funds which are now deeply involved in the U.S. Treasury market. Um, as key parts of the market structure here, um, as well as in the repo market. Um, the hedge funds have become big players in this market, that there was this cash basis futures trade, um, that, you know, they had rapid unwinding of that trade owing to the pressures of COVID and that, you know, contributed to the selling pressure and the illiquidity that came into this market. So that's one sort of strand of, of thinking that maybe it's the hedge funds that have a big deal to, to do here. But there's a larger problem, Bilal, which is that this market was going to collapse at some point, right? Like it was so institutionally fragile. There were so many situations that have contributed to this market becoming deeply eroded in its ability to manage stress. The primary dealers being, you know, reluctant to maintain liquidity. The HFT players having, you know, no obligation to stay on the market and they will leave, right? The fact that we don't even understand for the most part how this market works because information in this market has historically been very thinly provided. The fact that regulators are for the most part really just struggling to come to grips with this market. The fact that we haven't had basic protections put in place to deal with the changing market structure to a highly electronic one. Of course, it was going to collapse under stress like we saw in March 2020. And March 2020, you know, we dealt with lots and lots of selling from uh, foreign governments that were trying to get cash. We dealt with lots of um, money, you know, mutual funds and others that were trying to liquidate, that were trying to get cash. Unsurprising, obviously, that level of selling pressure meant that the liquidity providers who didn't have to be there decided, you know, why are we putting ourselves into this situation? Let's do some self-care and get the hell out of this marketplace, right? So unsurprising that it was going to struggle, unsurprising that struggle came to pass in March 2020, given the risk. Now, what's crazy is that these struggles continue. It's now two years on, as you said, Bilal, actually, it's almost three. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to, you know, it feels like the, it feels it doesn't feel that far away, but it's three years now. And we're constantly having to deal with moments of illiquidity, very, very sad levels of liquidity in this market today. So, um, I mean, have, 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 you know, you, you mentioned, you know, the lack of safeguards, lack of reporting, lack of uh, regulatory oversight or, or awareness or uh, um, understanding. I mean, has, has anything changed in three years since then? I mean, have, have regulators or have had some, has some change in the market to deal with that fallout? 
it, regulators are trying, right? So there's a host, a ho you know, a host of proposals that are coming to the fore to say we need to think about making this market more informationally open. Um, that we need to think about central clearing. That maybe we need to move to an all-to-all -all trading model. Um, there are a whole bunch of ideas. There's lots of creative energy now in the regulatory environment to say, let us do something. So, for example, the SEC has put out a proposal, you know, a concrete proposal that's saying that let's here's a way to bring in central clearing into this market for this market. So that will help make the market safer. There are also proposals by the Treasury as well as the SEC that will, in different ways, uh, look to increase transparency and informational reporting in this market. So there are all, there's all of this like deep and interesting uh, movement to say, let's transform this market from a, from a market that's been essentially neglected despite its importance to one now that we're paying loads of attention to to try and make it safer and, and more hospitable for the environment in which it finds itself. At the same time, when we look at the actual results, right? Like there's no there's no real rulemaking here. Like there's no real um, legislation or deep structural change that's been passed. Two reasons for that. One, regulation here takes a lot of time. Why? Because we're dealing with many regulators in this space, at least five agencies, if not more, none of whom have any primary authority. So if you look at the UK, for example, there's the, FCA, right, which is the main regulator for the marketplace. It's one single regulator, works obviously with the Bank of England and others, but it's the FCA that's going to react. In the US, there's a host of different reg regulators and agencies. You may, you know, there's the alphabet soup of the SEC, the CFTC, the OCC, the Fed. You know, I could go on, right? Now, in the case of the US equities markets, we all know it's the SEC that's the primary regulator. Obviously, it will work with other regulators and agencies, but SEC is the 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 cat. It's the boss, right? It's the you know, it's 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 it. In the case of Treasuries, um, we don't have that consensus. Like there is the there is the SEC that handles securities firms in this market that oversees the the one of the major trading platforms in this market. But then we also have the Fed, the New York Fed that's overseeing and that's responsible for the banks and the auctions. We have the U.S. Treasury. We have, uh, you know, the CFTC from the derivative side. We have FINRA as well that's dealing with the broker dealers in this market. So there are all of these different regulators. They all have to come to consensus. They all have to work together. They all have different institutional mandates. Some of them can't share information with others as easily. So rulemaking here takes time. It's unsurprising that there hasn't been that much rulemaking because every single rule requires that we go through the, all of all of these folks, and none of them have really any primary authority to be first movers to, you know, bring everyone together to say we are the primary cats in the um, in this place. Now there has obviously been some rule changes. 2017 for reporting, updated in 2019. That's really been the, one of the most significant aspects of treasury market market structure rulemaking. Um, beyond that, what what, what was that uh, reporting um, rule? The reporting rule um, was that members of, but basically broker dealers, um, essentially would, um, and banks obviously that are transacting in U.S. Treasury markets, that they would be reporting all of their secondary trades. Um, and so uh, the Finra broker dealers were reporting to Finra, the Fed, uh, the the banks were reporting to the Fed. Um, and what that did was it was trying to provide a picture of the the actual granular trading in place. Now, that rule was brought in in 2017 in response to the flash rally in 2014. And the finding in 2015, as we discussed before, that no one really knew anything about this market, like, you know, what the frazzle just happened in this market, we don't really know because we don't really have the information. Surprisingly, for those of us, Bilal, like, that are working in this field, not to have reporting requirements feels kind of strange, but that was the marketplace. So in 2017, we have reporting requirements for secondary trading for FINRA firms, for banks. Now, obviously what this means is that there, there were still gaps and there are still gaps in this reporting. So for example, many HFTs, not many HFTs are not FINRA broker dealers. They don't, they're not registered as FINRA broker dealers. So they're not reporting their trades in real time. As we discussed, HFTs 
HFTs have become a big part of this market, but a segment of them are not FINRA broker dealers and are not reporting. Hedge funds, many of them are most of, a lot of them are not FINRA broker dealers. Um, and so they are not reporting their trades in this market. So we have two big gaps already that have come from just the fact of how this rule was created, that it's focused on FINRA broker dealers and the banks, but that leaves um, HFTs, that leaves a hedge funds potentially out of this reporting perimeter. In 2019, there was an update to allow for um, more granular reporting, but again, um, it, it did not fill the gap of having HFTs and hedge funds do reporting. So that was the major piece of rulemaking that was put in place. Uh, we're still working on a bunch of other ideas. Now, the one last point that I will say is that it's really important in this market, more than obviously any other market, to get reform right. We can't afford to screw around in this market with bad ideas, right? Like, if you end up putting a bad idea in place, you're risking not just the U.S. market, you're risking the global market, the financial system. You're risking the quality of these safe assets that everyone is holding and things are super liquid. So, you know, it's um, it, from that perspective, it makes sense that we would take our time to think about things like central clearing or all to all trading or more transparency, because obviously the repercussions here are huge. But at the same time, there's some natural institutional problems with having responsive rulemaking here, which is that the agency structure here is very complicated and no single person is in charge. And if, if we put you in a hypothetical position where you were in charge of all regulation, what, say, three things would you implement to fix the treasury market? Well, the number one thing that I would implement is what I consider to be actually a pretty cool fix, like in the sense of being one that we're familiar with, um, relatively discreet, um, which is to have more affirmative market making obligations on the key, um, the key secondary market makers in this market in this in this space. So as we discussed, uh, Bilal, like this market, secondary trading in this market is so important. We always talk about liquidity. Liquidity means the ability of any investor in the world that wants to sell or buy their treasuries to be able to do so super easily without affecting prices. Traditionally, primary dealers have been the major market makers. That means the 25, they're not 25 of them, usually big banks, investment banks that stand ready to put their balance sheet in the line to buy and sell treasuries with Japan, with China, with hedge funds, mutual funds, so forth. Um, in addition, there's some super active high frequency traders in this market. The fact that they have left this market in time to stress has been problematic for liquidity, as you mentioned. So having these primary dealers, having some of the major HFTs take on a promise that they will stay on this market or do their best to in the event that there's a stress response. Or Are a there price. precedents of this obligation in other markets? I mean, is this done elsewhere? Um, this was done elsewhere. So for example, in the equity markets, the New York uh, specialist system, for example, um, required dealers in that, required the specialists, the New York, the New York uh, Stock Exchange specialists to stay on the market and provide, um, you know, just provide their balance sheets in order to maintain this market function. So they would stand there, they would keep their price changes. You wouldn't go from, you know, zero to 60 in terms of price changes. You'd have a very gradual price change in response to changing market conditions because the, the specialists were there to absorb the impact. So they promised to keep trading. Now, this 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 market maker system was a feature of the of the equity market um, for for a long time, and so it's it's a model that we're used to. We moved away from it um, gradually over time because equity markets are now filled with informal market makers. So it's it's a it's a much weaker system now, but it's one that we're used to. We're talking about the treasury market, Bilal. This is the market, as you said, which is the shock absorber to every other market. It's supposed to function under stress, but how is it going to function under stress when there's no one there to trade in it, right? I mean, what so, about the Fed? I mean, it seems like the Fed always steps up as the liquidity provider, lender, market maker of last resort. Um, yeah. is, is, I mean, all the, we, we know there's a final backstop, the Fed, but I suppose the issue is, is, is that the most optimal way of organizing a market? That's the big question, right? Yeah. So you can always say, and I think there have been some folks that have um, posited the Fed as the market maker of large resort, right? Like that the Fed's going to step in. 
And maybe for all intents and purposes, it is that because it will be there with the liquidity um, to provide to the big traders in the event that they're reluctant to come back to the market. We saw that in 2020. We saw that in September 2019 with the repo market, that the Fed's always going to be there with a nice checkbook and facility to say, look, we're going to help you out in this liquidity crunch. The Bank of England did that just now with the with the with the crisis in gilts. So clearly, the central banks know the importance of this market. It's key to the overall economic, um, and the economic aura that they inhabit as part of the institutional setup of their own marketplaces. So obviously, they're going to support that. But equally, we are in a complicated environment in which many central banks, including obviously the Fed, are doing quantitative tightening at this point, right? So the ability to go in there, or at least, you know, put themselves forward as being the backstops of last resort, the liquidity providers of last resort, from a quantitative tightening standpoint, is more complicated. In addition, in addition, obviously, there's this institutional thing, which you just mentioned, which is why, you know, should we rely on a public institution to backstop private risk taking ultimately in this marketplace, right? Like, should we not ask the private folks in this market who are clearly some of the most important institutions in our markets anywhere to step up and, and take responsibility? Or do we want a marketplace in which the public entity, the Fed, is is going to be very explicitly, much more express, you know, expressly than it is today, acting as the market maker of large resorts. So that's an institutional question, a political question, a policy question that we all have to engage with. If we do come to the to the to the fore by saying that ultimately, let's just look to the Fed to step up and provide liquidity when no one else does. <clears throat> And uh, so you you mentioned you know one of the things you would implement if you were the super regulator would be this uh, obligation for market makers to offer um, you know liquidity at times of stress. Is there anything else? I mean, you mentioned uh, um, central clearing or all to all trading. Are you know are those things? Would those things be helpful? Or are they just interesting ideas that would help at the margin but are not central? They're great ideas, and I think they're ideas that are really important to explore for solving different kinds of problems. So, for example. In the case of central clearing, central clearing is a response to counterparty risk for the most part, right? This is an institution that's there that stands by to take on a contract in the event that the original counterparty can't do it, right? So for example, if you and I are trading Bilal and I decide that I really need a hold in the Bahamas and I really can't bother trading with you, uh, the central counterparty is going to step in and, and take over that obligation. So they're going to sell you the treasury, uh, when I promise to do so, but I'm too busy sunning myself in the Bahamas to do it. Um, and so the central counterparty will step in and do that. So that counterparty risk is a specific problem that obviously exists in our market. Now, it's very, very, very pernicious and pervasive in most markets. So the equities and derivatives markets that are more heterogeneous, that are more diverse and open to different kinds of players. So for example, you have, um, you know, all different types of traders in the equity markets that are jumping into this market to transact. It's a, it's a very diverse marketplace from that perspective. And so obviously it's likely that some folks are going to collapse and off, you know, off, you know, go off to the Bahamas or go insolvent or whatever. And so central clearing has provided that backstop to provide and solve for counterparty risk in those spaces. In treasuries, it's been a very primary dealer orientated market for the most part, which has meant that you're dealing with institutions that have big buffers of resources that are not likely to disappear to the Bahamas anytime soon, that have lots of um, club-like relationships with other primary dealers in a way that they engage and constantly trust one another. So the need for a central clearinghouse has been less pressing in the U.S. Treasury market traditionally. But as we discussed, this is a market now that's becoming more open to having hedge funds, to having HFT players. So of course, we should anticipate the possibility of counterparty risk happening in this market and maybe we solve for it through a clearinghouse. The issue obviously with a clearinghouse is that you're concentrating risk, is that this becomes an institution now that is essentially taking on the failure risk, the default risk of any number of institutions in the market for a market that is literally huge, that is insanely huge. We have around um, you know, $4 trillion worth of bilateral repos outstanding around 67, 60 to 70% of them are backed by treasuries. We have a market that transacts around four 
billion dollars worth of securities a day altogether, four to five hundred billion dollars of securities a day altogether in the secondary market. So the overall market here is huge. Who wants to take on that level of counterparty risk? Um, which policymakers are going to stand up and say, this is the kind of risk mitigation that we need that would make this market a fail safe, fully reliable in all circumstances, come rain or shine or earthquakes or whatever. How do we do that? Do our traditional mechanisms for netting, for set off, for margin satisfy in this case? Um, you know, for example, you know, treasuries do come in different maturities and different um, in different um, uh, with different terms. How do you set them off as easily as you might say equities, for example? So these are all really important questions for figuring out when we try and solve for counterparty risk. Are we creating another gigantic problem, which is the too big to fail problem? of any too big to fail problem, like the freaking Death Star that we're building within our own market. So that's kind of central clearing and, and it's a it's a really cool idea. It solves for um, counterparty risk, but what other problems mm -hmm. are we creating here potentially? And, um, uh, Don? No, please. I was, I was going to just say, um, if we just look ahead for the next say 12 months, if if markets struck, if the mic microstructure is as it currently is, does it mean that the market is still very, very fragile? So we could see another repeat of what we saw in March 2020. I mean, is that still possible? So in my opinion, absolutely. In my opinion, mm -hmm. 155 million percent. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, like if we don't solve the problem, we are bound to see repeats of it. I mean, that's the traditional saying. Um, we cannot expect to see different results with similar approaches. So I, I don't see um, that changing. I think we become more cognizant of the problem. So I think we're probably better primed to not be surprised um, when there are conniptions in this market, when there are disappearances of liquidity in this market. None of us are particularly like shocked. It happens. It's going to happen. Um, but the pro point is, it's going to happen. And so one has to ask, oneself, like from just a policy matter, what does this mean for treasuries as a safe asset going forward, right? Like the whole fundamental foundation of the safe asset is immediate, unquestioned, unshakable liquidity. And if that is under doubt, particularly in the context of when you need it in stress, then what does that mean for the capacity of treasury, the safe asset to be that safe asset fundamentally? And then what does it mean for all this entire regulatory system we've set up today in financial regulation and securities markets that looks to treasuries as unquestionably, unquestioningly the safe asset to keep every firm buffered up and safe. What does it mean for that? Right? So, you know, I think exactly you say, Bilal, I have no doubt that if we stay with the market structure we have today, if we keep, keep on going like we have today, the problems are going to keep happening. Over time, though, what's the consequences of this? That we just come to expect it. But what does it mean for U.S. Treasuries um, as the quintessential safe asset, as the premier safe haven, as the place where you expect liquidity, come what may? And that's an open question. I mean, with, with that sort of backdrop, I mean, what do you think investors will do? Uh, you know, investors who hold treasuries, I mean, do you think they'll start to reduce the allocations to treasuries? Um, is there a question around what, what's the alternative? I mean, what else can you put your money into if it's not treasuries? That's exactly it, right? What else is there? Um, and so far, the answer is not much, right? So, uh, you know, treasuries remain the safe asset uh, for the most part. Um, I do think that investors understand, however, that there is more illiquidity premium that could be built into this security over time. Um, I think investors get that. So, for example, foreign investors who foreign countries, for example, that were selling heavily did come up against the problem that they were unable to get their order satisfied and fulfilled. So next time when they try and do this, they're either going to have to be super creative about how they manage their selling um, or they're just going to have to accept the fact that there's going to be some level of liquidity built into this um, design. Now, there was an article in the Financial Times, for example, where a number of traders were commenting on the fact that. Um, if they wanted to sell, you know, 500 million of treasuries, it would be fairly easy. But now they're having to restructure their orders in different ways in order to do that. So, you're, so it's obvious that 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 folks in this market that are active in this market are taking on added costs to deal with the liquidity, to to manage the liquidity. That transaction cost is is being internalized. Now, what does that mean for 
their own internal systems about how they price this risk. Now, that's going to be something that one can expect to emerge in efficient markets over time, where investors are taking on transaction costs that they did not anticipate before, where big traders like foreign governments and et cetera are now making changes in how they approach wh whom they trade with. Um, and that's going to add cost. And so at some point, these folks are going to have to pr you know, price it in in some level of illiquidity premium attaching to this. Again, there may not be an alternative, but it does mean that for the U.S. government, they may have to pay more to borrow because folks are now pricing in the fact that we're dealing with a, a more illiquid market on the margins and in, 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 in its market structure. And so that's something that they have to think about. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that rates are already going up, right? So the, the borrowing the U.S. government is doing now is much more expensive than it was, um, you know, two, two, three years ago, obviously. Um, and so now it's 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 hard to say that folks can afford this illiquidity premium. You're paying for it, right? Like there's already a built-in cost because debt is now more expensive. But in addition to that, you're having to pay for potentially um, the fact of illiquidity attaching to these instruments. Now, I know you've also been looking at crypto as well, you know, which... As, Ironically, at point, consider two very different markets, Bill. Different Alan, markets, you know, but, you know, at, at, crypto at, at, one time, so, yeah. at one time, people were arguing that crypto could replace the dollar and, 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 and oh, US sure. markets. But of course, over yeah. the past year, crypto has gone through its own crises. Um, and in some ways, ironically... We've had a crypto financial crisis before we've had a fiat financial crisis, um, right. which is yeah. kind of ironic. Um, you know, what, what are some of your thoughts around crypto and in particular regulation? Because the whole idea of crypto was it's decentralized, permissionless, you don't need regulation, you know, people will self-regulate and so on. Yet we've had uh, a huge number of, um, you know, uh, of, of crises from stablecoin to obviously FTX. And now there's a number of further exchanges and, and, and broker dealers who are coming under fire. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts around, uh, around this all? Well, it's obviously a massive crisis of confidence. Um, and it's a crisis of confidence in the fact that the major institutions in crypto um, from Terra Luna in May to FTX now have collapsed spectacularly. Um, and obviously we're dealing with other big institutions which are now in chapter 11, Celsius, Voyager, um, Genesis, for example, is on the brink. And so these are massive institutions that were um, providing not just the fact of having assets in the market, but also, uh, you know, these were institutions that were providing a lot of credibility to the market. For example, cryptocurrency exchanges, Bilal, as, 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 as you know, you've talked about before is, you know, these are institutions that are super important for this market. They have made this market accessible for average people. Um, not many folks have, uh, normal people have the, the, the wherewithal to transact on blockchains, to go on, um, you know, to, to, to self custody their keys and so forth. Um, and exchanges have provided a whole bunch of facilities for them to manage that process whilst getting exposure to crypto and, and being part of that environment. Um, and now with FTX, arguably the big bastion of compliance, like the one that was marketing itself as like the safe place, as the super um, DC friendly uh, crypto exchange, for that to go bust caused a huge crisis of confidence. And so the question is, how do you make that confidence come back? Um, and it's, you know, it's it's interesting to see that folks in the industry as well, you know, folks that have been evangelists for um, having a marketplace that regulates itself, that can trust itself enough to regulate uh, self-regulate, that even those evangelists have said that some regulation here is needed um, in order to restore general public faith in this market, to bring folks back into this market. As you know, Bilal, with any market, you need networks, you need network effects, um, you need folks that are willing to provide liquidity. And if people can't trust the yeah, institutions to which they're handing over their money, whether they be Celsius or Voyager or FTX or whatever, then obviously that's going to be a problem for creating these network effects. And so regulation is is one response to that to say, here's some external validation, protection, insurance that you can have in order to, to bring that faith back. Now, what is interesting, Bilal, and I would love to hear your thoughts on it, is that, you know, folks do obviously comment on the fact that many decentralized aspects of this market are still working. So, for example, when you look at Bitcoin activity on the actual blockchains, that that's still continuing apace, that um, many of the decentralized protocols that operate on, um, you know, for lending, um, that many of these decentralized protocols have actually continued to work. Um, decentralized exchanges, for example, have seen enormous inflows um, after the FTX collapse. And so 
it's it's interesting to see these two things come together, which is on the one hand, the collapse is raising the urgency and calls for regulation as a way to 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 restore faith in industry. And yet at the same time, some of its more some of its more decentralized aspects still continuing to work, um, notwithstanding the fact that it's been going through enormous stress over this last um six months or so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think one challenge for the decentralized exchanges are that you know the interfaces are quite clunky and quite difficult. Yeah. And then also there's a lack of transparency often around the types of flows and transactions that occur on those yeah. decentralized exchanges. And so often it's not clear whether um, you as a consumer, you know, whether you're getting the, the best price or not. Um, so so yeah. I think that's one of the challenges for these little decentralized exchanges. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I mean, I, I'm a lawyer and so, you know, I'm not like the most technically savvy cat on the planet. And so like having to self custody, having to, you know, get wallets that are sophisticated to be able to work along different protocols to, to do all these different things. I mean, that's, that's, that's hard for folks, even those who are engaged in this space to, to, to do that. In addition, obviously decentralized ex exchanges can be more expensive to use just to buy liquidity. And so, you know, that's another problem that you're paying for. Um, you know, you're paying for the fact that you're in a particular environment. Um, and as we know, with centralized exchanges, just from the the perspective of customers, is that they do provide a lot of lure to customers, a lot of ways in which customers get engaged. They are, um, they have these smartphone apps that are super usable. They provide margin. I mean, they provide all these different services that have meant that users have become sticky and attached to these exchanges because they're getting credit. They have these ready-made market makers, see Alameda, for example, that are standing around to provide liquidity. And so they've, they've created these very centralized models in these exchanges, hugely centralized, so much more than the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ is going to be, so centralized that it's providing a whole host of not just trading, but also financing for customers that have meant that the 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 base, the network has grown, you know, so, so fast, so quickly because they're they have they've proven themselves to be so attractive. Um, how decentralized exchanges are able to do that, it's hard to say, but it's clear that they definitely have seen a lot more popularity um following the FTX collapse, even though they are technically a little bit harder to use, obviously. And do you think um these centralized exchanges can self-regulate or not? I mean, are there precedents in traditional markets where you have some self-regulating or, or private sort of regulation of, um, of exchanges? Bilal, you know, most of our exchanges today are categorized as self-regulating organizations. Um, so the um, when you have a national exchange, it is a self-regulating organization, SRO, traditionally under um, under regulation. But the caveat here is under regulation. Um, so, you know, it's interesting when you look at the history of the New York Stock Exchange, securities exchanges, they began as self-regulating organizations. They uh, began essentially as from the Buttonwood Agreement way back when the 1790s or whatever, with a bunch of broker dealers coming together to, you know, essentially protect themselves in the market and work together. Now, there are clear issues over time with various abuses that took place and so forth, but that self-regulating model was very much par for the course in our securities markets. Um, now, obviously, it's self-regulating, but within an oversight structure um, provided by the Securities uh, and Exchange Act and, and different securities laws. So there is self-regulation in this market. Um, when you go and you list your securities in the New York Stock Exchange or whatever, you are subject to the authority of the New York Stock Exchange acting as a quasi-regulator. When you trade in the New York Stock Exchange, you're subject to the authority of the New York Stock Exchange acting as a quasi-regulator. So that definitely occurs. Now, the question is, how do we get crypto exchanges to that? I have a paper on this, actually, um, which looks exactly at this issue that, you know, as a way to make crypto exchanges be much more, um, to be much better governed, to take very precise way steps to clean themselves up, to figure out how to ensure that they are not subject to these humongous conflicts of interest and other problems as a way to be more honest, as a way to be more accountable, that maybe self-regulation, to be designated as self-regulators is one step there, one part of the solution, um, which is that regulators force them 
to essentially take on the mantle of self-regulation. So they have to come up with rules. They have to come up with accountability structures. They have to look at their own internal governance. And that very much follows in a paradigm that's adopted historically in securities and derivatives markets where the major exchanges have always been self-regulating with various degrees of regulation over time. So they'd have to come into some countries' regulatory oversight then. They'd have to come under the US something, you know, the US Exchange Act or something that, and, and then fall under that as a SRO, presumably. Yeah, that, you know, that, that you know, Congress or some, or some, or the UK Parliament or the FCA kind of come up with some kind of um, framework for them to act as self-regulating organizations that okay. in order to be able to to act as, as the self-regulating organization or to have the privileges that come with it in order to be able to transact as really, you know, to host transactions and to be able to, 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 uh, to have the, uh, uh, you know, certain rights and privileges as part of the secondary market, in order to do that, you have to follow certain steps. You have to make sure that your internal governance is sound. You have to make sure that you have, you know, capital buffers. You have to make sure that you're not subject to masses of conflicts of interest, that you have, you know, structures in place to surveil the market. When we look at FTX, we look at what a complete cluster it was. Now it's becoming clear, right? It was just the the, the hugest shit show, uh, seemingly based on the bankruptcy filing, with no record keeping, apparently with no you know board even of you know of directors, with very basic risk controls completely missing, with commingling of assets between customers and Alameda and others. That all of these situations would have to be you know would be dealt with when you have a decent internal governance, you know, structure for corporate governance, prudential regulation, risk management, and, and, and compliance. So that's one way in which to essentially force these exchanges to get their shizzle together as a way to garner credibility and have the rights and privileges involved in being able to transact in digital assets, however defined. I like that word chisel. I might start to use that now. Um, <laughs> yeah. What's, what's, I mean, what's your, what's your, what's your take on uh, crypto in the long term then? I mean, do you think that crypto is here to stay, even though we've had uh, all of this, um, all of these crises over the past 12 months, or, or, or do you think it's going to fade into insignificance? Well, the crypto tech is is very much agnostic to all the craziness that we have we have seen. Mm. I mean, the the human foibles of FTX, of F, you know, allegedly of SBF and and that group, um, the 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 greed, I guess, of trying to promise unbelievable yields um, and then present oneself as a quasi bank. Um, you know, these things are these things are part of a culture that has not you know, that has, that has grown up with ample amounts of money and liquidity and the ability to essentially bullshit. Um, now, in, in that doesn't take away from the fact that we're dealing with tech that is interesting, that is doing things. Um, when we look at these decentralized applications, the, the smart contracts are functioning, the Bitcoin blockchain is functioning. What can we, what, you know, the, the various iterations in the blockchain to make it more efficient, you know, various, you know, layer two solutions or whatever that are in place to make those blockchains work better. Like that's all happening. That technological development is happening. Um, and so it's, 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 it's fair to say that that technology is unlikely to go back into the his history books. Like it's here, like we, we have to deal with it. We can't turn back time and pretend it doesn't exist or it didn't exist. In addition, obviously not all crypto is the same. So one would looks at stable coins, for example, um, you know, stable coins have provided a mechanism that actually has some use cases now when one looks at, for example, refugees that are putting money into stable coins as a way to maintain their holdings in assets that they can transact across borders. Um, so it's, it's, you know, the UN, for example, use stable coins as a way to provide payments to displaced individuals. And so, you know, there are not all crypto is 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 the same the volatility in a bitcoin for example is certainly not what one would expect in a decent stable coin and so trying to be able to 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 separate the two and say well this is what this asset is for and this is for what this asset is for is part of that process of learning the capacities of these different asset classes what their risks are what potentially the opportunities might be and you know what kind of responses we need from regulators to be able to manage the trade offs between these risks and opportunities
That's great. Now, I did want to ask some uh, personal questions as well uh, to round off our conversation. I'm very boring, Bill. I'll have to tell you that. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm it won't sure take are. long. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what is more for sort of a general investment question? And I know you're more of an academic, and you look at things from a legal perspective. But you know, what, what's what's the best investment advice you've ever received from anyone? Um, the best investment advice I've received from anyone, I think, and this is the most. This is what I mean. I'm so boring, but I I, I feel sad that you're even asking me this because the answers are going to be so crap. But it's. It's really to be literate. Um, I think that financial literacy is something that is missing in so many conversations that being able to be educated about just basics on how capital is about, you know, how it works, what basic instruments do, um, just how to think about valuation. I think it's great. There's so many free courses out there um, that one should just take advantage of all the freebies on the internet and just get literate to be able to say, well, here's where I want to put my money and then be educated about the risks involved. When one looks at, for example, you know, crypto, it's, it's, there's so much exuberance that was there in that market, so much froth in that market. And folks were able to be taken advantage of to some extent because, you're dealing with situations in which it's hard to get information on these. Well, I just said, you know, it's free, but it's, you know, you have to work hard to analyze the risks involved, to think about them, to think, well, how am I going to get, you know, 14% yields when I just deposit my crypto here? Like, how is that yield going to be generated? The ability to be skeptical of those statements comes from a place of literacy. So I think that, you know, trying to to get educated, trying to be circumspect, taking your time, like, it's such boring advice, but I oh, think that's, that's it's great advice. In fact, I mean, we've, I um, we've been producing these free explainers on different financial market concepts, you know, like what does duration mean when you invest in a bond oh. and what is proof of stake, what's proof of work. And yeah. they've been really, really popular, I found, you know, so there's definitely a hunger out there for people to learn more about this. So so I'm, I'm definitely on the same page as you in terms of, uh, you know, financial literacy. Um, another question I wanted to ask was about uh, people leaving university. And you know, we do have a segment of our audience who are, you know, youngsters, you know, people who are just about to leave university. They're they're thinking about their next step into the into the so-called real world. I mean, what advice yeah. would you give to people after they graduate or as they're graduating? It's it's a tough world out there, um, mm-hmm. and I think it's really easy to get lost. Um, in the sense that you don't know whether to approach this world as a super confident person. So there is maybe this inclination to go in there and say, I should be the boss, right? Like mm-hmm. I should I should run this place. Um, and then there's this other part of you, which is like, oh shit, um, I don't know anything. And I have no right to be here. I am an imposter here. Everyone else knows more than me. What the hell am I doing here? And that level of imposterism, that level of self-doubt, that level of self-questioning really stands in the way of learning. That really stands in the way of feeling like you are, you have a voice, that you should be there, that you have a, an ability to then incorporate yourself into organizations in which you're joining. Um, and so I think it's this really interesting thing that folks have to learn to do, and I have a, such a hard time doing it, between finding your confidence and being confident believing that you have a right to be somewhere, recognizing that it's valid, it's real, um, but also recognizing it takes time to develop judgment, right? Like you may have knowledge, you may be the smartest person in the world, but it takes a while to get judgment, right? Like when you're dealing and choosing between different options, all of which are relatively reasonable, judgment comes into play. And that takes experience, it takes time, it takes failure, it takes success, it takes all sorts. And so being able to get to that place where you're like, I, I'm okay learning. I'm okay being patient. I'm okay waiting to, to, to reach a certain point. But the fact that I haven't got there yet doesn't mean I'm bad. doesn't mean I suck. doesn't mean I'm shit. It means that I have every right to be here and I'm here to learn and I'm here to, to engage and I have every right to be a voice in the room. Um, and so I think like one of the best pieces of advice I had, which is ironic considering how much I've been talking on this podcast, 
um, is to learn, is to hear, is listen, really. It's free. Like listening is free. Like just listening to all these smart people in the world is free. Doesn't mean you're less smart. It just means you're able to, to take and internalize pieces of information you might not have been able to do if you were not paying attention. Um, and I think for folks going into this world out there, take advantage of everyone else who's been there, who's had to suffer, who's had to suffer pain to be in the positions they're in, take their lessons. They are free lessons and then try not to make the same mistakes of them as them and be patient until you get the judgment to be able to handle all the complex decision making that you will face in life going forward. So I think, you know, that's again, super boring advice, but it's, it's one that I'm constantly having to, to deal with, which is how do you be confident, feel like you know something versus being able to acknowledge that you have a right to be in a, in a space in the room. That's great. That's great advice there. And, and just in terms of sectors, um, you obviously, uh, you yeah, practice law in the private sector, you're in academia now, um, you know, academia as a, as a career choice, I mean, would, you know, would you recommend that to, to people or? It's an amazing choice. Um, it's a choice that comes with a lot of trade-offs. So for example, as an academic, um, there's no one type of academic, which is the fun part, which is that you can be super active uh, publishing papers, but you can also be really active um, in policy making, depending on how you um, want to spend your time. Obviously, you're researching. Teaching is incredible. It's so much fun. Um, you can be a part of the real world by engaging with policymakers, engaging with practitioners, taking part in active conversations about reform. So you can do that. And that gives you so much freedom and flexibility. And it's like the best job in the world. Like, it's amazing that way that you don't have to necessarily choose. Well, holy shit, do I have to only be a paper person in an ivory tower? No, you don't. You can actually be in the real world. And engage and talk to people. And that's a really great way in which you get ideas and in which you grow and which you develop in which you harness the energy of this incredibly innovative private sector in the financial system that we have. Um, equally, it is a profession that does mean that you have to do a lot of this stuff yourself. Um, it's a lonely profession in many ways because you're kind of having to, um, you don't get the the same teams you get in the normal workplace. Um, you're having to write your own papers, as you know, Bilal, right? Like you're having to engage with ideas yourself. You're an entrepreneur in some ways for the for for that. So you have to be prepared that it's a little monastic. It's a little lonely. You have to do all the work yourself and that work never really stops. So even if you've written one paper, it's on to the next and and that can be a little exhausting sometimes. But it is really an amazing job being able to teach and research and have the ability to talk about interesting things like we're doing today is just fabulous. And uh, no, that's great. And, uh, you know, in terms of that um, learning, um, it's quite easy to be overwhelmed with all this information that we have and research and so on. I mean, do you have any productivity hacks or any systems you use to stay on top of, of uh, research and uh, news? I... I'm so glad you asked me that question, Bilal, because I have a seriously hard time adulting. Um, mm. I um, I consider myself to be um, extremely terrible at time management. Quite frankly, I have friends who are just incredible. I just do like 17 different things in a day and then you see them running marathons and, and starting their own businesses and all sorts. And I just feel like, you know, I could watch another episode of this Netflix show. And um, But equally, obviously, it's clear that there are there's so much out there. There's so much incredible, uh, incredible, incredibly interesting projects to get involved in. I'm constantly having to 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 choose. So you know, one of the productivity hacks really for me is is to to choose wisely, to really be very circumspect about the kind of areas that I want to put my time into um, and energy into. I love market structure. But that obviously means I'm not spending a ton of time on corporate governance, looking at Elon Musk and Twitter and, you know, what all sorts. I'm not doing that stuff. Um, I'm choosing. I'm choosing a particular field. I'm choosing a particular topic, treasuries. I'm choosing crypto. I'm choosing bond markets that, you know, that is um, that's that's a part of 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 the process, which is, you know, having the ability to stand back and say, I'm going to choose this and that because obviously you can't do everything all the time. 
Um, and one thing I did try and do over the Christmas break, being so crap at productivity, Bilal, um, is taking a couple of days off, you know? Um, I think it does reap dividends. I know that sounds trite, um, but it does. Uh, I took a couple of days off. I watched a ton of Netflix and Extraordinary Attorney Wu and all sorts of shows. And and it's 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 good to to take a little break because I think when you come back to the, to the process of having to try and choose and so forth, you have a little bit of, of breathing time there. So um, I'm not the best person to ask about productivity hacks. I, I kind of suck at that. No. You mentioned Netflix there, um, the extraordinary attorney, which I've seen. I love that show, by the way. Um, oh, good. Okay. We, can, we can share recommendations. Exactly. And any other recommendations? Um, you know, I love. I loved. Um, let me see. What was the last thing I I watched before that? Um, I watched. You put me in 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 a bind here. I watched Industry, like you said. Um, oh, yeah. That was that had to be. I don't know what you thought of that, but it was a really stressful show to watch. Yeah. And one of the things that you know, one of my friends uh, told me was that that show seems to have a phone going off in every single scene. Oh, that's true. As, that's as a, a way point. to try and you know remind. So it's it's kind of interesting to watch that show because I'm not sure whether I necessarily want to watch um, shows that remind me of of a past life, particularly such a stressful one. But um, that was kind of kind of cool and awesome and, and different. Um, in addition, I watched the English. I don't know if you saw that on Amazon. Yeah, I've seen the English with Emily Blunt. Uh, exactly. What yeah. did you think? Well, I've watched half of it, and, and to be honest, I'm, I'm starting. I'm not sure how I feel about it. It's uh, I've watched three episodes. I think it's six in total. Yeah. And I'm kind of losing a bit of interest. I mean, it's a great concept, and visually, it looks stunning. Um, but I don't know. Have you watched the whole show? I watched the whole show and I would recommend you going would. to the end. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I would recommend getting to the end. I thought it was at the end, it was, it was incredibly lyrical and beautiful and okay. the, the scenery is, is incredibly beautiful, but I can, I can see why during the middle you might lag, but if you, if you, and it does take a while to get into, but I think by the end there's, there's a, a huge sense of, um, of beauty to it that comes at the end. Yeah. So I, 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 I I love that. I also loved Wednesday. Um, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if you've seen Okay, I've, I've seen a few show. episodes and I've seen um, a million TikToks of uh, Wednesday dancing, you know, the prom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've tried that dance myself. Failed, obviously. But um, <laughs> so I think I've seen that show plenty of times, too. So there's a there's a mixed bag there. But, um, you know, I recently don't... watched uh, White Lotus season two. That's very good. I haven't yet. That's on the list. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely worth watching. Um, I'm currently watching Chippendales, the Chippendales um, miniseries with Camille Okay, Manita. yeah, I think I'm perhaps more geared towards women, I think. Uh, so I've, I've kind of uh, veered maybe, away from but it. but it's, it's a drama. My dad is watching it too. Just oh, okay. Point, so. Okay, so maybe it's... Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> no, he's, he's cool with it, so... <laughs> okay, great. Well, on a more serious note then, um, uh, I did want to ask about books as well. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what, what are some of the books that have really influenced you over your, your career, whether it's work-related or outside of work even? Yeah, I mean, I think that if I if I can just get the academic stuff. I mean, I think a book by Lawrence Harris called Trading and Exchanges, these trading exchanges, um, was the book that made market structure accessible to me. And, you know, coming at it from a lawyer as from a lawyer standpoint, market structure is not the thing that most lawyers are into because it is it is a as you know, Bilal, like it is, you know, it, it feels like a broy financially minded field for the Excel cats out there. And but you know, the the design of of systems is so intriguing and interesting, and the systems we take for granted as being self evident obviously have so many moving parts and fragilities to them that, as a legal person, understanding those is is critical. And I felt that Trading and Exchanges by Lawrence Harris as a book was one of the most um, really significant books I read for my field currently, and just being able to make everything very accessible, bite sized We talked about literacy earlier. Um, and it was something that provided that introduction in a very accessible way. So I would recommend it to anyone wanting to get involved in market structure, just to learn about how markets are, are working, how secondary markets work. Take a minute and read that book. It's it's superb. Um, in terms of, you know, just books, um, Hilary Mantel's series on Thomas Cromwell, um, Wolf Hall, and others bringing up the bodies and her her latest one um 
Mirror in the Light. I mean, those are just incredible books um, for understanding human behavior, human characters, a period in history that is one in which we feel is very far away, but some of the machinations are internal dialogues, internal monologues are similar, how people behave. And I think I felt the same way when I read Anna Karenina as well, not to, you know, another book in which you see so much human drama in which human behavior is remarkably similar. And to what we experience today, same kind of pressures, feelings, thoughts, ambitions, frustrations, senses of futility and so forth that you can see your, you know, the current world in the past. And I think having that perspective is is reassuring in some ways that you're not totally wrong, that what you're feeling, even if it's fragility and weakness and has been felt before, but also offers a little roadmap to try and understand people better and try and be empathetic towards them. Um, and so I think those two books or sets of books have been really remarkable for me. Um, and my favorite, I think, book of all time in some ways, which is a weird book to choose, is The First Man by Albert Camus. It's not his most well-known work, okay. um, but it's his most personal work. And again, it's a study of the human character, which is a really beautiful one, which is his own. And it was the manuscript was found in his car where he unfortunately passed away. Um, and it's been preserved and it's a it's a stunning, stunning read. So just some That's great, great selection history and there. then trading in exchange with my Lawrence Harris, I must read. <laughs> hey. No, that's great. We've covered so much ground. You know, I've learned a lot as well through this conversation. Um, now, how can people follow you if they wanted to, uh, to follow your work? Um, I that's have it. no idea. I think at this stage, Bilal, you want me to give you a Twitter handle? Well, I don't, I haven't done social media. I really suck okay. at that too. I mean, having very little chill, I don't think I could handle social media, frankly. But, um, you know, I, I have a fake Twitter up there, but I don't have a real one um, that I use. But I think um, SSRN is a is a good place, which yeah. is um, this collection, which I would recommend to everyone, honestly. If you have an academic subject you're interested in or think about, just go to SSRN um, and plug in that topic and you will get any number of amazing academic or, you know, not, you know, just a whole variety of free papers that you can read um, from the entire global collection. Really, it's a fantastic resource. So obviously I post my papers up there. Um, I have a web page up, Yeshi Adiv, and all, folks are welcome to email if, if you know, and and so I have that. Um, I'm being, I'm getting persuaded that I should join LinkedIn at some point. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I should, <laughs> just not sure how to handle all that, but at some point I guess I will. So that's probably going to be another way at some point. Okay, great. I'll I'll add the I'll add the links to your personal homepage and then also the SSRN. That's uh, very kind your, of your people, well. um, I'm I'm okay. here, and I'm you know, folks are very very welcome to reach out if there's something interesting that they would like to discuss. Yeah. Well, it was great, great speaking to you and, and you know, good luck with all of your, your, your work. And, um, and I look forward to sort of reading your, your latest uh, research as, as it comes out. And Bilal, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Microhive is just a fantastic resource. I have really loved your past podcast and I feel so honored um, and privileged that you would ask me to be on this one. So um, like I said, it's a great way to start 2023 I've learned so much from your past work um, on this uh, on this uh, forum. And so I'm really excited about what you have to bring in the new year. Thank you so Great. much for having me. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure. Great. Yeah, sure. That was excellent. I really enjoyed it. Hopefully yeah, you enjoyed okay. it as well. I loved it. This is what I meant. I just wanted a ton of time that I could spend with you rather than being <laughs> harassed by email. Like, ah, yes. it's always like... So I'm, but you know, thank you so much for being so patient with me and just letting me do this. Yeah, yeah, and it's great. You're you're a lot of fun to to speak to. You're very knowledgeable. You, uh, yeah, yeah. You're. You know, I'm sorry you're if right. I bloviate and just talk and talk and talk like what the stupid treasury is, but I apologize. No, no, that's what I wanted you to do, and and uh, and it's very very good. So. <laughs> so what what's your plans for the coming year in terms of like your focus and what you want to get involved? Um, yeah, well, I mean the. Um, you know, my sort of day job is, you know, the, the, you know, the podcast show is one aspect of what I do, but my day job is MacroHive as a company, we provide yeah. independent research to investors. And so just covering markets and uh, we're, um, so, so one is just covering markets, you know, inflation yeah. fed and all these sorts of things. But the other thing I'm focusing a lot on at the moment is um, 
some sort of quantitative models and machine learning models to trade oh, markets awesome. and things like that. And um, I've been looking a lot recently at chat GPT as well, which I think is yeah, quite, quite sure. awesome. So I've been playing well, around. The thing is scary. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Rather it's, you than me. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, do you do yeah. conferences? Like, do you get involved in academic conferences and stuff? Like, um, it... Yeah, sometimes I'm actually speaking. Um, I'm giving a talk at Harvard, like um, online next week as remote because I'm based in London um, yeah. on private equity. So awesome. I've been I've been publishing um, or talking recently about private equity bubble bursting. So I'll be speaking yeah. there. Um, and then I sometimes speaking give the business school. Um, I think it's the finance. I need to check which department, whether it's the business school or the finance department. I need to double check. Um, uh, so I do occasional lectures at LSE, Cambridge, and things like that. Um, so sometimes what I do in, um, I used to do this at Cass Business School, but I'm probably going to, that, that ended recently. Uh, but um, I'll probably do something at Cambridge at the business school there. Yeah, where I do guest lectures on the um, masters of finance courses. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because often the academics want, as you as you know, you know, practitioners to come in. So what I do is I um, I relate uh, finance theory to how people in markets uh, trade. Awesome. So then I'll talk about you know CAPM or you know whatever UIP in in yeah, um, and say this is actually how you translate this to markets and this is how we use it and this is what works That's what doesn't work. Wonderful. So, yeah, so I do stuff like that, um, and I and I do interact a lot with academics and, and things. Because one one part of what we do at Macrohive is we um, every week we find a, an, an interesting academic paper and we summarize it and we send it out oh. to all of our clients. So so that we we stay on top of what academics are doing, Great. Um, and then we kind of collaborate with them sometimes as well. So you know, if you're interested, I mean, I don't know, like given that you're doing this, I mean, we do a lot of conferences. I mean, it's from the legal side a little bit, um, yeah. but. You know, if there's a cool one in crypto that we're going to get involved in or whatever, you know, love to um, invite yeah, yeah. you. Yeah, more, more than that. happy to. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've spoken to a couple of crypto conferences before and um, yeah, no, more, more than happy to. And where, where are you guys based? You said... Um, I mean, Nashville, but Nashville. I mean, I do. Yeah, but I mean, to be honest, it's like... I mean, I don't know if you're going to be in the States sometime. And if that's the case, it becomes easier just to... Yeah, I think I'll be in the States probably February. I'm giving a talk at, I think, MIT, actually, at the business school. Oh, you there. are? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Well, if you let me know when the dates are, then yeah, you know, yeah. maybe there's a way to... to Because, I mean, I'm trying to do a bunch of conferences and, or conferences or just conversations or whatever on crypto, for example, with the crisis. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm yeah, very happy, happy to, yeah. to see if... By the way, what's Nashville like? Is it, is it Nashville as in with country music is Nashville. Yeah, exactly the same. That's Nashville, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the only way to find out, Bill, is to show up. Okay, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one the of those bi-coastal people. The only way to do it people. is empirically, okay? So. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a bi-coastal person, you know, like New York and LA, San Francisco. I'm sure you are, but we're going to have to change that. We're yeah, have yeah. 2023 resolution, try new shit and <laughs> go into the middle. <laughs> Go to the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take that local flight, Bilal. Yeah. You know, it's, Actually, it's the other the question really... then is, uh, is is abortion illegal now in your state or not? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that's the middle. Yeah. yeah, good to know, right? Like, one hundred percent, it's illegal. Um, uh, so yeah, it's 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 like a thing because you know, for Vandy, it's like a very, it's a great uni, it's a top uni. And yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and they're trying to recruit women, obviously. And so yeah. how do you get women? If I know, yeah, 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 yeah. Or it's... students, you know, if you're in the state in which you can't. Yeah, I have to say as a European, it's just weird, all yeah. this stuff that's happened in the US. Weird. It's just like, what direction? It, it just, it's just, <laughs> it's... It's like monumentally effed up. Yeah. So, so, I mean, we're going a bit off tangent here. So if you did want to get an abortion, you have to cross state travel. lines. You have to find a state yeah. nearby that's where yeah. it's legal. You have to travel. Yeah, and there are these other things where maybe you can use a VPN and then you have to, you know, go into these telehealth providers and they can send you okay. the post. But that's still illegal. I mean, technically, it's it's illegal. Um, so. Yeah. You have to, so people are, but you know, you people are literally crossing state lines, going into a car park, making the phone call to the telehealth provider, getting the abortion pills and then having to, I mean, but you know, there, but you know, even apart from abortion, like IVF is being threatened, right? Like, cause you have oh, really? to, 
Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. In the case because... of IVF, you have to deal, you know, destroy some embryos and stuff. And so that's apparently Gosh, it's, it's yeah. stunning. Yeah. Wow. So it's 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 messed up, Bilal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh. So you you know, Nashville is supposed to be super progressive and it is very, very progressive in some ways, but yeah the but is... there's a state around you as well that like you have to cater to yeah you have to follow yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of portion that you know trans rights are and you know gay and trans rights lgbtq issues have yeah you know all of all of this it's just mind it's like what are we doing with ourselves yeah 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 gosh so, yeah you know. well so it'll be more for an anthropological trip to Nashville then. <laughs> Come, it's not going to be like the English, okay? Just FYI, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not going to have to like traverse via horse. Like I'll take, you... <laughs> I'll keep you safe. But okay, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, we'll find a way to get you over. Yeah, look forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but then. Thank you Great. so much for having me. Yeah. I've, been, I've enjoyed meeting you and getting to chat. Yeah. Love to stay Likewise. In touch. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.